This week on Jerusalem Dateline, the Afghanistan pullout scene as a fulfillment of Islamic prophecy. What does that mean for Jerusalem? And Hamas gets a crippling blow from a former ally in its war against Israel. And a visit to a hidden treasure in Jerusalem's old city. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Many observers in the West see the U.S. pullout from Afghanistan as a geopolitical disaster and also a tragedy for those left behind under Taliban rule. For the other side, the impact has a different meaning. While seen as a military victory by the Taliban and other Muslims, there's also an element of fulfilling Islamic prophecy that sets its sights on Jerusalem. The Taliban Twitter page carried this message. Black flags will rise from Khorasan and nothing will be able to return them. The Taliban are now flying their white flags, but black flags come during a time of war. This is very important. I haven't heard this talked about in the mainstream media at all. But if we look at some of the main end time prophecies within Islam, I mean, one of the biggest prophecies, there's a prophecy that says armies carrying black flags will come from the area of the east or Khorasan. Khorasan is an ancient land that includes modern northwest Pakistan, eastern Iran, and all of Afghanistan. Joel Richardson wrote the best-selling book, The Islamic Antichrist. He explained the importance of this prophecy on the recent CBN webinar, Afghanistan, What's Next After the U.S. Pullout. It says, an army will come from Khorasan carrying black flags, and it says this, if you see them, give them your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice because this is the army of the Mehdi, or in English, you could just say the Mahdi, the vice regent of Allah. So this is one of their biggest end time prophecies. Afghanistan is the heart of Khorasan. Sheikh Imran Hossein, a Muslim expert on Islamic prophecies, connects the U.S. pullout in Afghanistan to this prophecy. What is happening in Afghanistan is validating the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad that a Muslim army is destined to come out of Afghanistan, of Khorasan, and no one will be able to stop it until it reaches Jerusalem. The prophecy points here to Jerusalem as the final goal of the Mahdi's army, where it expects to plant its flags there on the Temple Mount. Jerusalem is the barometer. Jerusalem is the epicenter. Jerusalem is the goal. That's Satan's target. That's where Jesus is going to return, reestablish the throne of his father David and rule the world from. Satan's very well aware of that. While some Muslims may not know about these prophecies or even agree with them, Richardson says the world should understand how parts of the Islamic world perceive the U.S. pullout from Afghanistan. Well, as Christians, of course, we don't give any credence to Islamic prophecy. It's not inspired by God. It's, it's largely inspired by Satan. But the point is this. It gives us a glimpse into the playbook of the enemy. Muslims, many Muslims that are very, very well aware of their own prophecies, they see this as the fulfillment of Islamic prophecy. And there is power in prophecy. It's a tremendous recruiting tool. The Taliban see themselves as this army. And the ISIS branch in Afghanistan calls itself ISIS-K, K for Khorasan. Given the unfolding developments, it's likely Afghanistan will once again become a magnet for Muslims around the world to join the black flags of Khorasan. While radicals made headway in Afghanistan, a major blow to Hamas, as the government of Sudan, once an ally of the terrorist group, seized a number of its financial assets. The move cripples its efforts to wage war on Israel. It's also symbolic of larger changes taking place in the Middle East. It represents a significant shift in the region and more evidence the Abraham Accords continue to bear fruit. While Hamas and the Gaza Strip remains a formidable military foe to Israel, the decision by Sudan strikes at the way Hamas finances their terror state. With a blow to Hamas uh, financial capabilities, which uh, is important by itself because Sudan was a major center where Hamas uh, economic activity was taking place and was the main uh, source of income for the organization, for the movement. Retired General Yossi Kupavasar is the former head of Israel's military intelligence. He says Sudan, once a state sponsor of terror, is shifting its alliance to the West. 
it's important for Sudan because it's a message that uh, it is really trying to get rid of its past as a hub for Hamas activity and Hamas financial activity. At one time, Sudan was a hub for radical Islam, even harboring Osama bin Laden in the 1990s. But in 2019, the Sudanese overthrew dictator Omar al-Bashir, and the government began to change. Last year, President Trump paved the way for a Sudan-Israel peace when he removed Sudan from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Cooper Vasa says the Abraham Accords played an enormous part in Sudan's decision. Definitely. I think when Sudan decided to embark on this initiative and join the Abraham Accord, they knew what is the price. I mean, I think that the Americans and maybe even the Israelis were delivering this message. You cannot have the Abraham Accords on the one hand and they keep supporting Hamas on the other. The world continues to watch Israel's fight in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. After nine months into a massive vaccination campaign, the country is relying heavily on its Green Pass, which allows those vaccinated to have greater access to public venues. This growing dependence is causing distress among some Israelis. Prime Minister Neftali Bennett sounded positive as statistics show Israel recovering from its fourth surge of the pandemic. In the battle against the coronavirus, it seems at this point that we have the upper hand. All parameters show a gradual decrease in morbidity. The confirmed cases are in decline. Still, Bennett cautioned against relaxing preventative efforts. Despite the overall positive direction, no one should enter into complacency facing the elusive virus. We're continuing with the campaign with our might, and we're also preparing for the next stage. That includes a change to Israel's Green Pass. Technical difficulties postponed its launch, but only those have received a booster or a second dose or have recovered all less than six months ago will qualify for the pass. Venues such as indoor restaurants, gyms, and university campuses are expected to check each patron's pass and ID. That sent protesters to the streets against the green passes and what they called forced compliance. We are totally against any, any forced vaccinations or any forced medications. Signs in car windows said, tomorrow it's you and democracy is gone. I've represented Israel across the world. I've gone on college campuses. I fought for Israel and I'm ashamed today of what Israel is doing. Israel began offering the Pfizer biotech boosters to those over 12 and more than a third of the 9 million citizens have received it, according to the health ministry. From the beginning, medical experts have had mixed reactions to the green passes. Renowned immunologist Dr. Zvi Bentwich of Ben-Gurion University is part of the Emergency Public Council for the Corona Crisis. We are not against vaccination, but we are against the usage of a measure that would cause discrimination and enforcement of measures that would impinge on basically on human rights. Professor David Enoch at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem disagrees. When done properly, it does not violate a human or civil right. Giving at least a fairly successful vaccination effort, green passport policy is the way to do that. Having a policy, let's say in restaurants, that everybody will wear a mask and there would be some sort of distancing, but by saying that you cannot enter a place unless you have this passport, that's a different story. For the most part, Israelis just want life to return to normal, including allowing an unlimited number of tourists back in the country. Until then, even disagreeing medical minds will continue to look for ways to successfully prevent and treat the virus. Up next, remembering Israel's deadliest war and the miracle of a dove. Israel marked the 48th anniversary of the start of the 1973 Yom Kippur War on October 6th, when combined Arab armies mounted a surprise attack on the holiest day of the Jewish year. More soldiers died and were injured in that war than in any of Israel's other wars. Former Israeli commander Efi Yatam was sent on a daring mission to go behind enemy lines and take the Syrian division headquarters. What happened next, he says, seemed like a miracle. I was throwing hand grenades, shooting, you know, in the broad uh, 
concrete corridors. And then when I turn behind uh, one of the corners of the corridors, which was full of smoke and dust, I saw a silhouette, a kind of um, coming, something coming out of the dust and the smoke towards me. I was very sure it's a, it's a Syrian soldier. And I, 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 I took my rifle and I was aiming the rifle. I was ready to pull the trigger. And then I saw a bird coming out of the smoke. She just flew behind my hand and she stood on my right shoulder. So I just whipped her out and she turned again and stood on my left shoulder. It was in the middle of a shooting battle. So I completed the assault and the hand grenades and everything. And when I went out of the bunker, I saw a dove, a pigeon, standing on my, on my left shoulder. I just tried to let her out of my shoulder. She turned and she was very determined not to leave me. I put my hand just like that and she stood on my hand. Despite Itam's attempts to get rid of the dove, she stayed with him and his unit for the next 10 days in some of the most intense battles of the Yom Kippur War. Since we had that angel protecting us, none of my company soldiers was killed or wounded. And we were involved in very, in very intensive battles. She was with us, patrolling a little bit forward, looking what's going on around, sitting here. Finally, after nearly two weeks of frontline conflict, Itam and his unit were sent to the rear for a rest. And when I put my, my feet uh, down the vehicle which brought us from the front to, to the territory of the state of Israel, she flew away and disappeared. It was in front of the eyes thousands of soldiers. Since that experience, through many special commando operations, the sense of the miraculous and God's protection has never left Etam. The same protection promised in the 23rd Psalm. I trained myself to see miracles uh, around me, around the, uh, the operations which I conducted. It's as we know, Gam Salmavit Even when I am in valley of death and evil, I'm not afraid because God is with me. Still ahead, a special guide reveals a hidden treasure in Jerusalem. World. About a million people visited Jerusalem's Western Wall during the last two months of special prayers and the High Holy Days. Most people would recognize the Western Wall or Kotel in Hebrew. But there's a hidden treasure in Jerusalem's old city called the Little Western Wall. And we have a special little guide to take us there. We're going to go to the Little Kotel. You ready? Okay. <laughs>
Well, that's one of the special treasures here in Jerusalem. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.